Welcome, Jack, to Linear Rock. <laughs> can I just say, can I just say, I didn't understand a word of that, and I could have listened to that for like 10 more hours. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was talking about the band. I was saying, you know, um, that we are here presenting the Exclamation album uh, uh -huh. by Dead Boys Society. Uh, you're the frontman of the band. Uh, the album is out now on Spy Farm Records. And after eight years, you know, of hard work, you just released uh, your debut album, ironically, in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, is that exclamation mark on the cover so some way connected uh, to this sense, you know, of confusion, perplexity or disorientation that we are now living worldwide or it simply you know wants to get attention expressing a sort of you know finally here we are check this out uh we're dead boy society like a sort of catharsis after so long i think that you're nailing a lot of aspects of the reason we did that i i you know we didn't necessarily name it that because of the pandemic or anything but but a lot of those emotions that you just brought up are, in fact, uh, aspects of the album uh, and things that we have we write from very personal places. And that definitely comes across in that album title. I mean, when we picked the album title, we knew that there was gonna, it was going to be a difficult thing to explain, like mm -hmm. what the title is. But when we listen to each song overlooking at that that symbol it just made sense and every single song felt like it fit that that exclamation that that uh sense of chaos and that sense of uh extreme yeah oh captain my captain carpe diem <laughs> <laughs> is the inspiration behind the name of the band some way connected to robin williams movie from 1989 under you know that went under the same name basically that was poets and you are poet but you are plural that was a singular one but has it something to do with that uh you know to be completely honest not really no <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> And when I first joined the band, I joined about a year after they were named Dead Poet Society. And it was a completely different lineup. It, at the on, only original band member from the original lineup is the guitarist. Okay. And uh, The other and Jack. <laughs> the other Jack, yeah. The <laughs> other Jack. And when he first formed the band, they were all sitting around the lunch table at the college we went to in Boston. And they were just like, we need a band name. We need a band name. They just, he was just like, what about Dead Poet Society? And they were all just kind of like, yeah, let's do it. Because they just wanted to get something going. They wanted to get something starting. And when I joined the band, I was like, guys, like, <laughs> band name kind of sucks. Can we change it? <laughs> and, then, and everybody was like, nah, we already made the Facebook page and everything. So I'm like, okay. And then here we are eight years later. And we're like, why the fuck do we name our band Dead Poet Society? Oh, well, <laughs> it's whatever. But yeah, no, it's like it literally came down to a split second decision. It's a good name, by the way. But have you seen the movie? No. No, never. Oh my God! You should. You don't no. want to do. You you don't want to see. It. <laughs> at this point, yeah. At this point, it's like I I've made it this far. I might as well just never see it. <laughs> okay, Jack. You stated that a perfect symbol for Dead Poet Society <laughs> is the shitty old seven string that guitarist Jack Collins. Here he comes again. Bought mm -hmm. you know at the mall back in high school days. Uh, why you said that? I mean, why is that a symbol for the band? Is that a sort of talisman? And did you use it on the record, actually? Uh, yeah, so that's, that fretless seven string kind of became a staple of our band because uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't even uh, because it was just this random thing that Jack decided to, you know, bring this old guitar up that he and our original bassist, Nick Taylor, destroyed when they were in high school and by taking all the frets off and uh -huh. they kind of rendered it useless because <laughs> they thought it was going to be cool. And then they were like, oh, we've ruined the guitar. OK, time to put it away. <laughs> and so they give it to he brings it up like our sophomore year of college. And he's like, yo, check this thing out. It kind of sounds kind of cool. And, and he played it and it it. It didn't sound it sounded like a guitar but it didn't sound like a guitar it kind of sounded like a slide guitar but it didn't sound like a slide guitar we were just like that's so weird 
And it's like we need to we need to write something with this. And and we ended up writing our first song we ever wrote with it was a song called Low Air that's on our Spotify. It's still in our top and we released that like back in like twenty sixteen. Uh-huh. And um and it just has such a unique sound to it that unlocks uh an emotion and a feeling when we're writing and allows us to be so creative with something that feels familiar but then when you play it is completely unfamiliar and it forces you to write in a particular way and so that's why it's such a staple of how we write is because it's just it it's so inspiring to write with because everything you come up with on it sounds cool <laughs> it just all sounds good <laughs> So, sounds unique. I'm, uh, exactly. I must, <laughs> uh, yeah. what, git- what guitar is that? It's like a Gibson, uh, <laughs> no, it's just Ibanez. Like a, it's it's a, just like this cheap, it's like this cheap <laughs> Schecter. It's like this cheap, okay. m- real metal looking, like, wah, kind of looking Schecter. And, uh, black? And it's black. It's one? black. Yeah, entirely of course. Black, entirely <laughs> black. EMG pickups, everything. It's, it's, such a, it's such a cheesy looking little cheap piece of crap and but it it <laughs> has always made an amazing sound for us and we're actually building a new one like a really nice one and uh and i can't wait to use that thing because it's gonna it's gonna sound nice it's gonna be a lot easier to play too hopefully because that thing is hard to play okay heavy sound but melodic as well you are modern, but with a classic nature as well. A wide range, um, like, you know, from Led Zeppelin to Coldplay, if we have to, to put, you know. Um, um, and personally, you remind me a lot of Muse and Wolf Mother, by okay. the way. No, I'll take them. Um, I'll take them. That's nice. <laughs> how, how you thought, you know, this particular sound, um, is it something you worked on or is it the natural evolution of all your influences since you are four different guys i think it's i think it's a combination of the two i think uh i think that we all have crippling adhd and so we get bored unbelievably quick like Mm. always so quick so whenever we're writing something new uh it it's hard for it to sound like the last thing because we kind of all get bored of that sound very quickly so it's like this rapid evolution in how we write and feel and and how we express all those all those feelings and uh and i think that that plays into the other part of it which is all of the different influences we all had growing up i mean none of us listen to all of us shared rock in common, but but we all listen to so many different artists and genre types, and and it's and and one thing that we've all agreed upon, and I think is the reason why we listen to so many genres is that music is and art in general is just one hundred percent inarguably about feeling. It is yeah. it you your job as an artist is to take feeling this thing that is naturally intangible and put it into something tangible to try and evoke that same emotion back and and uh so so uh yeah so i think that that is what kind of plays into that that constant evolution is that we're constantly seeking out that feeling and that comes through our previous influences and and uh and yeah and since you are very rapid, I mean, some of the songs you composed in the very first place are, in fact, on the record, or you changed completely and they've been thrown away. Uh, I would no, I would, I would say not because the way we write is that once again, going back to our ADHD, if if we get bored of something, it never gets finished. So we have like a million little half songs, <laughs> okay. but it's only the ones that hold our attention to the end that get finished. And then th- those we put on the record and, okay. and okay. they make it to the world. Okay. Yeah. On Coda, which is the song that we're going to play now, a song from 2018, which was re-recorded mm-hmm. now in an even more explosive <laughs> new version. In the lyrics, you say, you love me like cocaine so can love create like a dangerous addiction and is it about love in a universal sense like you know the love for what you do 
also as you know the long process of devotion that brought you guys to the debut album for example that's you know a work of love as well so what do you think uh i would say is if is can love be a dangerous addiction and that is i mean that nails it i mean that is what it is is that, that is 100 percent true and i think that that is what this song i've never heard somebody put it like that before so yeah that is that is very very true and uh i think that that's what this song is is about and that it's it just says it it says it the exact way that it's supposed to be said. You say, talk shit, you, you love me like cocaine. It's like, you, it's, it's this unhealthy relationship of, of caring about somebody who might just treat you like absolute dog shit. And, but they don't leave and they don't want to leave and you don't either. And, but it's, so it's, yeah, it's an addiction. And, uh, and so, yeah, it is very true. And I think you could apply it if you wanted to, to a more broader sense to fit other topics. But that is definitely what the song is about. Yeah. About Coda, before we see the video, did you know that the song is in the top 20 of the strip club rock songs this week at number four? In <laughs> no. <laughs> you didn't know Get that? Get the okay. fuck out of here. <laughs> It's in good company, you know, Royal Blood, Foo Fighters, ACDC, you're number four. And at number one, there's the song Moon Fever. Uh, by Moon Fever, the song is called Cocaine, by the way. So Cocaine Returns. And um, so you didn't know about that. And by the way, strip clubs are already reopened in America because there's, you know, this chart. So I guess. Priorities. Yeah, priority. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're open? Uh I think they're open. I think oh. they're open. No, no, I don't think so. I think they have to do like outdoor stuff. They're figuring it out. But priorities, right? Get those open first and then we'll figure out about the rest of the country. <laughs> and by the way, Coda, in these top 20 strip club rock songs, is, is there since two months and you've been also number three. So now you're number four. So you must check it out. It's also on Spotify. So you, you can That's check it. That's hysterical. I, don't, I need to find this chart and I need to show my parents. They're going to be so <laughs> proud. Yeah, you bet. Your song titles are always written with dots before and after. Yeah. And uh, there's a unique word with no poses in between the words. Does this choice have a particular symbolism? Just the exclamation mark that you put on the cover? Uh, yeah, it's the same. It's the same idea. It, you know, we're very driven towards uh, letting the art dictate the art. And we are feeling cringe creatures before we're thinking creatures. And so if something feels good, go with it always. And so we, uh, we didn't even intend to write the names in any sort of unique way or any, had any intention of that. But when we saw that, we were like, whoa, that gives us a vibe. That gives us a feeling. Let's go with that. So you mean that it happened by chance that, you know, yeah, yeah it kind of happened by chance because uh -uh. I mean, it's it doesn't you know it doesn't feel like you need to if it every every little aspect can be manipulated to contribute to the art and that wasn't an intention but it just kind of happened to it kind of happened to just give us a feeling and so we went with that feeling who had the idea who was the first one in the band having this idea you don't remember. i was I think it might have been the other Jack. I think it might have been the other Jack. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So he's the man. In the 80s and 90s, many bands moved, you know, from their cities to Los Angeles or New York, Seattle, Nashville, you know, in search of fortune because those were the places where things happened, especially in music. You moved from Boston to Orange County in an historic moment where, you know, with the internet, you can do everything and reach instantly every place in the world by a click. You, mm -hmm. in fact, reached hundreds of thousands of people with Spotify and YouTube. So why this choice of moving nowadays in another city? And did you find what you were looking for? Um, interesting. So so i do agree that with this newfound age of like just being able to do anything from wherever uh it, it does work it works and yeah. 
uh, there is a there is a less of a need to be concentrated physically in a certain part of the world. But at the same time, as I think this past year has shown, nothing replaces human interaction mm. and the absolute uh, integral part it has in society. And so when we decided to move to L.A., Orange County area, we kind of had that in mind. We wanted to we wanted to be, you know, part of the rock scene. We wanted to cut our teeth in a place in the world where music is king. And that was and that's L.A. So um, we figured if we moved out here, we'd meet other people that think like us. And we ended up meeting Bad Flower, who took us on their, you know, kind of our first large tour. Yeah. And that wouldn't have happened over the internet. Or maybe it would have. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? But so, you, so you're telling me that Boston is not a rock city? I mean, Aerosmith are from Boston. So that that's, if, you know. <laughs> if rock if rock is uh, is robotics or the medical field then then yeah boston is a rock city but if you are playing actual rock music it is, or you know just music in general the this the the music scene in boston is not fantastic okay. and having lived there for five years i can tell you that that despite having a very famous music college there are several famous music colleges it is not a it is not an environment that is uh very um healthy for music because oh. what you want is music is just sharing and feeling and when you do something like create a school for music you can't teach creativity that's just something that you can't that comes from within creativity comes from within and but the thing is when you apply a uh when you apply when somebody wants you to spend money doing it they're going to find a way to sell it to you and This is not to discredit. There are so many amazing professors mm -hmm. at Berkeley that that uh, I wouldn't have a lot of the philosophies and the way I hold myself and write music that I, I would have today if I hadn't met them. Uh, but I will say that there is a business aspect to the school that is a business and oh. it doesn't it promotes a more left brain way of thinking of music and a more competitive way of thinking about music, which is the antithesis of what music is. Music is all about sharing and connecting. Very and, interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. As, and so at Orange County, did you find actually this thing that you were looking for? Slowly but surely, you start to find it. You start to yeah. find that community of people that, that uh, think and feel the same way you do. And... But also, you know, to, to now argue against my point, I've found a lot of bands that we have connected with that I connect with their music and they don't live anywhere near here and we're planning tours with them. So, you know, fuck <laughs> me. I, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Love it. You live in Anaheim, which is mm -hmm. the NAM, which is one of the most important events in music in the world. And they, it happens every year. And you're close mm -hmm. to... Disneyland. So yes. that means that, you know, you're in the middle of a lot of things happening. So do you go there uh, quite often? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. In fact, I've never been to Disneyland. No. And, uh, <laughs> That's and, unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. But it's one of those things when you like when you live there, there's no motivation to go because what's there's nothing special, you know? Yeah. So. But I mean, even then, I know so many people that grew up here and they go all day, every day, every year. I don't know. One day, one day I'll find the motivation to go. I, I used to have a rehearsal space, though, that was right next to Disneyland. And when you drive to it on the highway, you see the fireworks going off every single night. So that was pretty cool. So, okay, I, I guess now it's closed, but, you know, as soon as it will reopen. I think they're reopening. Are they reopening? reopening? Okay, yeah, so you, you have no it's excuse. It's weird over here. Everybody's okay. just kind of like, ah, oh, we're bored of this now, let's reopen. Okay, so now you have time because you're at home, so you have no excuses, you must go there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And about the NAM, have you been there? Uh, yeah, I've been to NAM. I've been to NAM. I went two years in a row. Oh, it's like wow. a fun little, so, yeah, it's like a music nerd's Disneyland. 
Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's in, in the right place. You presented the Exclamation album in a live streaming film in the Nashville form of Beth Lauer Josh Katz, mm -hmm. um, who graciously offered his barn to, to stage the event. And since you already waited eight years to conquer the world making this record, <clears throat> let's say that for a real tour, you have to wait a little bit more. Uh, you are young, by the way, and you have a career of, ahead of you. But did you wonder how, you know, the show bids will be after this Corona thing, how this will affect what we had? What do you expect? And do you think it would be very different than it used to be? I think there will be a boom. I think there will be quite a big boom of concerts. And I think you'll see a lot of new venues opening up because we lost a lot of venues. So people will see opportunity there. I think people are just, everybody says it, but people are craving live music. People are craving to just go out again and have fun. And I think that, uh, I think that when stuff opens back up again, you're going to get a lot of live shows and you're going to get a lot of people just coming out and you'll probably see fans and, and new bands popping up because of this, because people will just be going out just to go out. Yeah. And I think it'll be cool. You like to play with contrasts and screwing with rock conventions. You said our goal is to make someone feel something that they haven't felt before. It's very ambitious and courageous also. Uh, so you're stating that rock is not that at all. Like, you know, some legends are saying, for instance, Gene Simmons of Kiss has been declaring this since years now that rock is dead and that there's no need, you know, for bands like Kiss to release new records. So which is your point of view on that? I think it's kind of honestly a combination of both because i don't i don't disagree with him i think that i i think that rock kind of lost its way mm -hmm. and that uh it turned into this very subdued like target commercial stomp clap kind of shit because like this is the thing is that is that through art and time you get this evolution and everything and art evolves just like everything in this universe evolves yeah and uh the only difference is that humans drive the evolution of this and the issue you get with rock is that at a certain point people started having this ultimate reverence for the bands of the past and like it could never be accomplished or it could never go anywhere ever again and that sort of rock is dead mentality it was just kind of accepted by people and it's just like this like <laughs> this like the best the best of the best have already passed there's nothing but but what but that's not what music is it it doesn't it it doesn't go extinct it, evol it evolves it evolves like like classical music and 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 may not be even recognizable today because it doesn't it doesn't exist anymore because it was it evolved into something else i mean you look at like uh like jazz evolved into into blues and r and b and and it has remnants of being jazz but it's not jazz anymore and mm. and that is the issue that we're running in today with rock is that is that these musicians of the past weren't running a race to finish it they're running a race with a baton and they're trying to pass that baton on to the next generation to say here's what we did take it and go somewhere with it yeah. and and the my generation was just sitting there being like oh you guys are sick and they're like do go somewhere with this with this <laughs> genre you know and it's like you get this it, what what happened was you get this sort of complacency in 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 not trying and not experimenting and that's exacerbated by by people wanting to make a living off of it and they found at, at a certain point that if you put some sort of blues stomp clap fucking will take back the night track on on a target commercial or a ford commercial well those sync really well so cool we'll land commercial so this commercial side of it kind of furthered this 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 discouragement of of innovation and trying new sounds and trying to be risky and trying to do something different with the genre and inspire again 
And so I think that my generation hit that point and 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 now you're seeing this new wave of rock that that is evolving into something new and it doesn't sound like the past because it's not supposed to sound like the past you know it's like it's like time to you know it's like leather jackets and painting your faces i mean don't get me wrong i know kiss is your favorite band but they <laughs> had their time they had their yeah. time and i agree with gene simmons that they don't really need to release more music okay. they can they can <laughs> They can, but they're not trying to pass the baton on anymore. It's like it's like it's up to a new generation to like, okay, cool, like un, like cool guitar solos were sick. Let's see what else we can do now. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like stomp clap is sick. Let's see what else we can do now. And uh, it's always it's always taking what you like and then trying to do something new with it. And you have a lot of musicians that are doing that, and that's what we're trying to do now. And uh, and you know. At the end of the day, we might not ever accomplish it, but at least we're trying. Because when you're experimenting, 99% of the stuff you come up with is going to sound horrible. And But it's about that 1% you find. And that's yeah. where that's where the evolution is. And rock may not, might not ever sound like rock. But if you continue to say, if you continue to glorify what it was, it will die. And it will not exist. And if you try to change it, it's not going to sound like it used to. Because it never will sound like that again. Yeah, but that's not a bad thing. It'll sound like something different. It'll sound like something good and new. And now, Jack, what happens? Do we have to wait another eight years for a second album, or you know, now you're gonna be quicker? And in the meantime, do you think you have what it really takes to become as Dead Poet Society, like the next big thing worldwide? Oh geez, there's no way to answer that question. <laughs> there's no way to answer. Oh that come question. on, be courageous, <laughs> be ambitious, <laughs> like you are. You, <laughs> the you you want to? I mean, every every kid when they start and join a band has a dream of being, you know, on a stage on Wembley. You know, at Wembley playing to eighty thousand people. Of course, of course, I want to be the biggest band on earth. I mean, like that's what you. That's what everybody dreams of. And yeah. we're just going to continue to do what we do. And we're not going to compromise. And we're just we're just going to continue to make art that we love and that we want to share with the world. And where that brings us will be where it brings us. And um, no, you won't have to wait eight years for another <laughs> album. Okay. <laughs> and then I'm not and, All right. No, no. So, uh, no, it's no, no, no. We already started on album two. So we, we are trying to set some ambitious deadlines for these next albums and so you'll have more stuff coming thanks jack for your time it's been a pleasure talking to you hope you're gonna go to disneyland and maybe you will have inspiration <laughs> for some new songs there and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you never know inspiration you know when when it comes so thanks so much and hope to see you soon in italy as well thank you so much for having me this was fun grazie ciao jack ciao have a nice day.